My name is Larry Wood. I am professor of theology and Wesley studies at Asbury Theological Seminary. And I'm glad today to welcome as our guest on campus and speaker for the Ryan Lectures, Dr. Frank Machia, who is professor of Christian theology at Vanguard University. He has served as president of the Society of Pentecostal Studies and for many years has been the senior editor of the NUMA. And he's also served on some very important uh, committees, such as the uh, Faith and Order Commission of the National Council of Churches. And uh, he has written many papers and books dealing with soteriology, pneumatology, and uh, ecumenical themes. One of his most recent books is entitled, Justified in the Spirit, Creation, Redemption, and the Triune God. And today, uh, this morning, in our chapel service, uh, he uh, presented a lecture to us today that was very inspiring, entitled, Justified in the Spirit, According to Galatians. And uh, so we're going to have a conversation that probably will stem in large part from that. Uh, Dr. Machia, uh, you are, uh, you are uh, a member of the Assembly of God, and uh, I'm a member of the United Methodist Church. There probably is a great deal more similarities than differences between us. And certainly uh, we're all part of the larger uh, understanding of, 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 uh, of a tradition that has appreciated an emphasis on the Holy Spirit. Um, my reflection about that goes back to the importance of Aldersgate for John Wesley. Uh, there's been a lot of debate about what really happened to Wesley at Aldersgate. I think there's some things that are pretty clear that happened to Wesley at Aldersgate. Uh, and that was a, a very, turning, very much of a turning point in his life uh, when he felt his heart strangely warmed. Uh, he had been discussing things with uh, some uh, Moravians and uh, they were telling him you could have the certainty of your relationship uh, with God. You could really know that you were uh, truly of God and uh, were truly saved and born of the Spirit. And uh, Wesley sought for that as a member of the Church of England. That, that had not been a part of his own legacy as such, that sense of certainty which he learned from the Moravians. And uh, as a result of his Aldersgate experience, uh, uh, right, up, right about that same time, he, he wrote a sermon on salvation by faith, which he talked about justification. And he understood it in the larger sense uh, and, and brought in the importance that justification uh, is everything from our acceptance with, uh, of, of, of God to uh, a real inner change that takes place in our life through the Holy Spirit, which uh, really goes along with the thing that you, you've been talking to us today about being justified in the Spirit. Um, I want to make one more comment, and I'm going to see where you go with this. Uh, after his Aldersgate experience, and he felt his heart strangely warm, he thought he would never have any more fear and doubt. He thought that, really, he thought that he probably had experienced what he had come to call Christian perfection. But he discovered he still had some doubt and fear. And he wanted to really find out more about, the, as he said, the things of God. And so he went to Hernhut in Germany and met with uh, the Moravians there, who were, that was the headquarters. And he talked with particularly a carpenter there who was a lay preacher by the name of Christian David, who told him that it was one thing to be justified. And in addition to that, it was important to be cleansed from all sin and to experience your own Pentecost and have the full assurance of faith. And that's what Wesley wanted, was a full assurance of faith. I suppose if there is anything that's been the driving forth and force in Methodism has been that quest for having the full assurance of faith. And Wesley defined that it really in terms of Christian perfection. And as we both know, uh, Pentecostalism uh, was an extension of that quest for full assurance. Uh, William Seymour, who, who studied at God's Bible School here in Cincinnati, uh, 
had some connections uh, in this area with Methodism. And, uh, and through uh, his influence in large part, uh, Pentecostalism in, in Los Angeles got launched. Uh, my question to you, do you suppose there would have been a Pentecostalism had it not been for Wesley's Aldersgate experience? I seriously doubt it. Uh, I mean, God and his sovereignty could do anything, but when you look at the history, you can see the significant dependence of the Pentecostal movement on that route. And I agree with you. I mean, when I look at Azusa Street, I see something similar as well. I mean, there's this drive for more of God, this drive to experience God, not just confess God or not just assume that because you know you've made a confession or have been baptized that somehow you can become a bench warmer in the church and your Christianity is settled and all is um, all going well. I think what the Wesleyan holiness and Pentecostal movements do is they try to wake up the bench warmers and to say there's more of God to be had, to be experienced. There's, a, a, there's, there's this quest that we're to be on. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, there are struggles. Uh, we groan in the Spirit, still somewhat burdened, and yet reaching by the Spirit for more of God, for greater and greater foretastes of that kingdom to come. And I see that. I see that uh, from Aldersgate to Azusa Street, if you will. And there's something very important about this. Um, this understanding of God as near at hand, as a presence in life that you can become aware of and that you can cultivate and that you can grow in as a dynamic, transformative experience. And for a lot of people who are raised in mainline churches where there's not much emphasis on the Holy Spirit, and they talk a lot about God as creator or even about Christ and his redemptive work. Without much emphasis on the spirit, there's often something lacking experientially to their confession. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people have testified of this um, when they got involved, for example, historically in the holiness movement or when they became involved in Pentecostal or charismatic movements. They often give testimonies that run something like this, you know, um, I had my confession, I believed in God as creator, I believed Christ gave all for me, but there was still something missing, a missing dimension to my Christian life. Faith wasn't that real to me as something that I could live. God as someone who I can experience and be aware of as a powerful force in my life. And when they discover this, it's like an awakening. It's, why didn't somebody tell me about this before? You know, why, did, why wasn't I aware of this before? Why, why has this been lacking? Why has this been missing? And it can really be a, a wonderfully rejuvenating experience. So I think we, we, we both share that kind of larger, I don't know what you would call it, pietistic, uh, you know, Wesleyan holiness, Pentecostal trajectory or, or, or cluster of families in the Christian church that has highlighted that third article of the creed, I think, if you will, without neglecting the other two. But, but I can, I can, uh, it's, it's, it can be a quite powerful awakening when people do discover that. One of the things that I have noticed uh, uh, from a number of uh, Pentecostal authors, including yourself, um, and I think it might arise out of a concern that those who maybe were not part of the Pentecostal movement but had sympathy for it were concerned that the work of the Son and the work of the Spirit could be divided up. And I see recently that uh, in the past few years that Pentecostals have really been addressing that issue. Very much so. Uh, it, the, the relationship of the third article, if you will, with the other two is a, is a concern of Pentecostal theology because of some of the extremes and abuses that have arisen historically. And uh, for example, with regard to the second article, I mean, uh, Pentecostalism has always had a strong focus on Jesus, but it has tended uh, historically to focus on the charismatic Christ, the one who conquers 
the forces of darkness through healing and other charismatic, charismatic manifestations of the spirit, but not as much emphasis on, for example, the virtues or um, the ethical kinds of commitments that Jesus had, not as strong there in that area, mm -hmm. uh, more oriented toward the power than the purity. And uh, we've seen how that has been abused. For example, in the 1990s uh, uh, with these controversies over these televangelists and the kind of lifestyles that they were living, very charismatic figures who were powerfully gifted and yet who um, really uh, did not base that as strongly as they needed to on the sanctified life, almost like a kind of Samson figure whose destiny becomes unfulfilled because of the fact that this richly gifted man did not discipline his passions. So I, I see Samson as kind of a metaphor for me of what can happen when Pentecostalism does not uh, have an adequate Christological basis uh, for its pneumatology. Uh, in terms of the first article of the Creed, uh, this issue became very much um, a concern of mine during the uh, six-year dialogue that I participated in with the Reformed. Uh, it was an international Reformed Pentecostal dialogue that occurred. And one point they were pressing was how Calvin had strongly emphasized the first article, that all, you know, God the Father, the one who elects and creates, that all of creation is meant to become the, you know, theater of God's glory. And uh, it occurred to me during that dialogue that we Pentecostals uh, tended, because of our Christ focus, to view pneumatology almost exclusively in soteriological categories, that we were not taking adequately into consideration the creation motif. Um, and so this Holy Spirit tended to be viewed as solely a supernatural force that breaks into the natural order to redeem and transform, but not as that which nourishes life and gives rise to it and is present even in natural processes. Mm -hmm. So I felt that uh, we Pentecostals needed to do a better job of connecting the spirit, not only with the second article, but with the first. And it was really the Calvinists who brought that to my attention. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, this is an area where we Pentecostals are, are doing work. And that is, it's good that we have this emphasis on the third article. It's been a wonderful gift to the church and we've joined with others in doing that including the holiness folk, but it's time to really do a lot more work in how that connects with the second and first articles. You know, it's very interesting that uh, in, in Wesley's day, with his emphasis on the Holy Spirit, uh, an emphasis that uh, John Fletcher particularly yes. picked up, John Fletcher, who was Wesley's designated successor. And I've appreciated your work in this area. Thank you, thank you. and. Um, Fletcher is a young man uh, who also had a great deal of influence over another very important uh, leader in Wesley's movement was Joseph Benson. And Joseph Benson uh, had great admiration for Fletcher. And Fletcher began to develop this aspect that he found in Wesley, particularly as a result of, of uh, what Wesley had to say about the Holy Spirit and Pentecost as a result of his going to Hernhut and talking with Christian David is where he really came up with this very strong idea of a difference between justifying faith and full sanctifying grace. And Fletcher picked up on that and began to develop it more consistently than he thought Wesley had done so. At one point, Wesley wrote him a letter, or not, not didn't write Fletcher a letter, but told him, you've got to be careful that you don't separate the spirit from the word who is Christ. And Fletcher wrote, uh, a letter to the young Benson at the time and he says, I want to caution you about a mistake I was making. I was not integrating the work of Christ with the work of the Spirit adequately and I don't want you to fall prey to that same mistake. And that was in a very, very decisive letter that I think that uh, Fletcher wrote Benson. And I, I think that uh, the holiness movement in general, the Western holiness movement in general, uh, has had that problem and I think the Pentecostals inherited it from the Wesleyan Holiness Movement. Uh, the thing that Fletcher had emphasized was that uh, taking from what, I mean, what Fletcher had emphasized, taking it from Wesley, uh, 
emphasis on circumcision of heart. Fletcher traces that back, you know, to Abraham. Uh, after he had been justified by faith, as Paul de describes it, as he believed God, that was what in Genesis uh, chapter 12. And then when you get to chapter 17, when Abraham was 99, he was 75 when he was justified by faith. When he was 99, the Lord came to Abraham and said, walk before me and be perfect. And uh, that was understood to be perfect in heart, not perfect in performance. We know that nobody is perfect in performance, but perfect and pure in heart. And it says in the self same day that the Lord told him to be perfect, the rite of circumcision was instituted as that particular mark of cleanness before God. And of course that became the theme of the prophets. Uh, that, you know, Jeremiah says, circumcise your hearts. That's what the Lord's interested in. And uh, so it becomes less circumcision and more cleansing of the heart. And, and when the prophets are expecting the latter days, they talk about the pouring out of the Spirit. They talk about sanctification. And when you, when you get to the book of Acts, and you get to Acts 2, and the pouring out of the Spirit, what really happened there? Uh, I think um, uh, sometimes we have focused too much on just the literal language of Acts 2 and not seeing the whole history of salvation and the context of how that fits in with circumcision, circumcision of heart. And then, you know, when Peter stood before the Jerusalem Council, in uh, Acts 15, 8 and 9, talking about Cornelius, that their hearts were cleansed by faith or circumcised by faith because the word cleansing had come to replace the word circumcision. Your hearts were cleansed by the Holy Spirit even as ours was on the day of Pentecost. And, and that became a very strong focus in Fletcher that the real purpose of Pentecost was to so clean up our life and clean up our hearts so there could be that intimacy with God. And, uh, and also, uh, we talked about this earlier in Romans 5, where Paul talked about, uh, and the love of God was poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, and that word poured out is Pentecost language, uh, that that is really a significant thing about the meaning of Pentecost. And it's more than just water baptism. Uh, and, uh, and it's interesting, uh, you served on the Faith and, and uh, Order Council uh, Commission uh, when, they, when they talked about the new uh, baptismal liturgy. They introduced the pneumatological element to say, you know, that baptism is more than just water baptism, but it's the laying on of hands. It's being filled with the Spirit. It's being baptized with the Spirit. It's, it's both aspects, distinct but interrelated signified in the larger meaning of Christian baptism. And, uh, and, I, and I think our movement uh, uh, in, a, in its original days of the Western Holmes tradition in the, in the late 19th century and throughout much of the 20th century, and then our connection with Pentecostalism, that's been a danger to disconnect Pentecost from Easter and to disconnect uh, the work of the Spirit from the work of Christ. And I think our movements are, are, are mutual move, movements are really beginning to, uh, to address that issue and, and come to grips with it. Yeah, I'm right with you there. Uh, we, we fail to sometimes recognize that the book of Acts doesn't begin with Pentecost. It begins with the risen Christ teaching the disciples about the coming kingdom. Yeah. Pentecost comes after that. And uh, it, is the ex it is the risen and exalted Christ who receives the Spirit from the Father and pours him out in Acts 2.33 and pours him out from the richness of his own life, death, and risen li resurrection. So, yeah, the Spirit definitely brings us on a Christophormistic path. Um, uh, a couple of things come to mind as I was listening to you. One is, uh, I think in terms of what we both share, one is this emphasis on the spirit outpouring, mm -hmm. that there is this turning point that takes place in the outpouring of the spirit, that it is a gift. Mm -hmm. And yet at the same time, there's also this reaching for fullness, which um, 
uh, also depicts ex key experiences, but also a process. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I was looking at, I was reading the book of Acts lately, and I was looking at this text in, you know, Acts chapter six, where it talks about the uh, choosing of the deacons, and it was describing the the qualifications that the deacons were to have, mm -hmm. and one of them were was that they were to be full of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, if being full of the Spirit was simply assumed at that time, that everyone has it, then why is it listed as a qualification for becoming a deacon? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> the, the fact that it's listed there seems to indicate that it's not something universally shared by the Christians. And then it occurred to me that in the book of Acts, everyone has the Spirit, of course. If all believers have the Spirit. But there is this richness, this fullness to the, to the Spirit that the Christians are urged to, to yield to, to yearn for, um, and to experience. Now, our traditions have come to de define that differently, but I've come to wonder how different really is it. I mean, uh, w when you think about it, we're both striving for more of God. We're both striving for a life that is flourishing in the spirit, that uh, displays um, signs of a life that is full of the spirit and flourishing in the spirit. We're both talking about how this has to be life transforming, how it has to be cleansing, how it has to be um, evidence of sanctification. Uh, Pentecostals would add the element of power and of witness, but I don't know of any Wesleyans who would denigrate that. No. So, uh, um, and, and, and my reading of the early Pentecostal literature is that they were not so much wanting to marginalize sanctification as speak of it in these other terms as well. well it, what it was. It was. You talk about sanctification just simply largely in terms of ethics. Yeah, it that's right. A very moralistic it does, doesn't it? it loses exactly. Its that's right. Exactly. It loses its dynamic. In fact, you wrote that at one point in a, a book. I seem to recall. Um, what was the title of that? Uh, something. Fire was in the title. I forget. Pentecostal now. grace, maybe. Yeah, maybe that was it. Right. I can't recall now. But I yeah. seem to. Re re I read something where you were saying that, and I agreed with it very much. Uh, I see the Pentecostals historically, uh, and I was mentioning earlier today, uh, when you read them in the heat of the polemics, you know, against the holiness folk, then you get that sharp separation between spirit baptism and sanctification. But when you're just listening to them talk about it, apart from the battle, when they're just like you and I are here speaking freely, they're talking about this in very Wesleyan terms. Sure. You know, it's a baptism in love. It's, it's, um, you know, uh, and in fact, I came across several quotes in, when writing my book on the baptism of the Spirit where early Pentecostal authors talk about the fact, well, it's all holiness. It's all Jesus, you know, and it's so on. So uh, what are we talking about here with the Pentecostal revival? Or are we talking about something in addition to sanctification? I don't think so. I think we're talking about a way of expanding our appreciation for sanctification in the direction of this more dynamic, vocational, missional kind of direction um, that, the that the sanctified life is the outward moving life, that the spirit, uh, who was it, Tillich said, the coming within is the, is, the, is the coming out. So the spirit that moves within moves us out. So the sanctified life is the life that is increasingly hospitable to the world, that opens a table of faith, that opens a table of gifts, that invites, that, that draws in that, that's, that's what sanctification is. It's an outward moving reality. It's an empowering reality. And um, so I like to see the Pentecostals as accenting a, vo a vocational sanctification. You know, you were, you were part of the commission of, uh, uh, of faith and order with the, is, was, was it with the World Council of Churches, or the National Council? The National Council of, yeah. of Churches. And um, the ecumenical renewal movement that led up to the, what was it, the 1981 Lima text, where the water baptism was supplemented with uh, the laying on of hands. Yeah, that's right. And both of them now understood in Christian baptism that Christian baptism involves water baptism and spirit baptism. Yeah, that's right. And uh, what, is, what, I, what I find so exciting about that 
it affords our tradition yeah, it does. to really uh, highlight this is what we've been saying. Yes, they are together. They're not to be divorced from each other. Christian baptism holds them together. Right. But much too long, Christian baptism only had Easter. Mm -hmm. It only had water. It didn't have the laying on, didn't have the spirit. That's right. In fact, in the uh, faith and order uh, conversations with Quakers, this is an issue that came up because in the Quaker movement, there is no water baptism. Mm -hmm. And what the World Council did was suggest that, well, this is what we have in common, spirit baptism. Mm -hmm. And that since water baptism is a witness to our being incorporated into Christ and the life of the spirit, um, uh, even if the rite is not present, we can still possess together the substance of what it is witnessing to. And so that became important for World Council conversations with Society of Friends. Um, but as an issue, I think is important. And, and like you, I would say baptism is very important. Um, I, I, in my own development, am becoming increasingly appreciative of it. But at the same time, there is this important distinction to be made that, that we're talking here. I mean, when you go back to John the Baptist, for example, I mean, his whole emphasis was, um, you know, I baptize with water, but he will baptize with the Spirit. And there is implied here not only a connection, but a contrast. And it's almost like saying, well, you can circumcise the foreskin, but God will circumcise the heart. And in the prophetic tradition, um, rituals are fine, but um, they're nothing without the spiritual substance. And the spiritual substance could never be collapsed into the ritual as though if you have that, you're just assumed to have the other. Not so, they are quite distinct. And John the Baptist talks about water and spirit in a way that makes a clear distinction, even a contrast. Uh, so we can't integrate them so intimately that, um, that we lose that distinction. That's right. That's right. And in the history of the church, the church has sometimes used spirit baptism as a critique against the church that relies too much on the water ritual mm -hmm. for Christian identity. And, and that critique is something I would want to preserve. It's interesting that, that Karl Barth, after he was an observer at Vatican II, and, uh, and after that uh, he wrote his fourth volume of Church Dogmatics, Part Four, and it was entitled The Baptism with the Holy Ghost. Yeah, that's right. Very important discussion. The only one I know of from that era, from a leading theologian, to really take up that topic. And uh, Tom Torrance, who edited and helped translate that, that right. volume, calls attention to that in the preface, said that you will notice there has been a distinct development in Bart's understanding of the Holy Spirit. That's right. And what's, uh, Marcus Bart, his son, a New Testament scholar, had written a commentary on Acts and also a little monograph on baptism where he makes a very clear distinction mm -hmm. uh, between spirit and water baptism. And uh, he came under criticism uh, by uh, a number of theologians for that. And his father took his side. Yeah. Well, you know, in that volume, Bart says, water baptism is the beginning of the Christian life. Baptism with the spirit is the perfection of the Christian life. And he has says, water baptism is the first step. Spirit baptism is a completion. And what he is doing is, is in the Roman Catholic tradition where you have water baptism and you have confirmation, water baptism representing Easter, confirmation representing Pentecost, and they get divided up. Uh, infant baptism only involves water, and then later you have confirmation. Uh, and. Uh, Bart, uh, and of course that was the issue that the Vatican was, was partly discussing. And, uh, and, and Bart was very involved in that from his reform standpoint, but came out with a theology that really, I mean, his own understanding of that. And he was saying that baptism of the Spirit signifies the outpouring of righteousness. And he linked it to sanctification and perfection. That's right. And then of course he goes on and he says, but of course all of this is imputed. <laughs> and, and, and so he, 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 he falls back into that very extreme reform position of imputation. 
But otherwise, his theology is really. But 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 he did say it had to be worked out. Yeah. And 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 then he also said there are, there are many instances in the book of Acts of the Spirit coming. Yeah. Right. And he says that indicates the progressive nature yeah, of your Christian right. life. Exactly the teleological yeah. development, which he claimed to learn from the Bloomharts as well in his um, the second section of his dogmatics on Jesus as Victor. Um, uh, that the victory. Uh, Berkauer, for example, in his book, The Triumph of Grace and the Theology of Karl Barth, accuses him of um, saying that, you know, the, the, the uh, finished work of Christ is so triumphant that faith simply settles the matter for Christians. Every, like you said, everything's imputed and that's it. You just sit on what Christ has done for the rest of our lives. And Bart comes at Berkauer in that section of the dogmatics entitled Jesus is Victor, where Bart says, that's not at all what I'm about that there is an ongoing conflict in a battle. There is a teleological development whereby one progresses and he, and he uses the Bloomhearts to defend this and the whole yeah. pietistic tradition. Um, and it's interesting that he was so opposed to pietism. Yeah, he I had, know. But, but he does. He does do that. He does give, give Bloomhart their due. Um, and also, Bart, he, Bart really wanted to be ecumenical in the Protestant sense. I and mean, he talks about justification, sanctification, and vocation. And he says faith includes all these dimensions. Um, and uh, he gets the vocational, I believe, from the Anabaptists. And so he wants to bring uh, Luther, uh, he, he would say Calvin, but we would add Wesley, because Cal uh, Bart saw Calvin as the great uh, sanctification defender. I think he's partially right about that. Uh, Calvin has lengthy discussions of regeneration and sanctification in his institutes. Luther didn't. I think the reform movement has it over the Lutherans on this. Yeah. They've been more pneumatological. I think that's right. Um, but, uh, but Bart talks about how we have to see sanctification as the purpose and goal of justification and then vocation as the outworking of that before the world. And I, I'm reading this and I'm saying, well, yeah, I could see in this, um, you know, the, the magisterial reformation, the Wesleyan tradition and the, the, the vocational element of the Pentecostal. So you can read that in a very different way. And, and I think that kind of ecumenical openness to, to talk about the Christian life in these expansive terms, seeking for more of God, is what we can work on together. And we may have um, some minor differences, but I really believe in the main points that we can work together toward a common goal. Your call, and maybe we don't need to close with this um, and uh, get your concluding comments as well, Frank. Um, it was, I, I find it very interesting that one of the last things that Bart wrote and said was that he had never really developed adequately a doctrine of the yes, Holy Spirit. That's right. That's right. And he said, I was always afraid of that because I was afraid of Schleiermacher. I was afraid <laughs> of modernism right. exactly. because the human spirit got got emphasized instead of the Holy Spirit. That's right. And, uh, exactly. and, I, and uh, uh, I think that, uh, of course, I think this is one of the important things about Moltmann. I think he, uh, to some extent, offered uh, a way out of that inadequacy in Bart, though Bart was not happy about what he saw going on there. But maybe if Bart had known a little more about the Westland movement and the Pentecostal movement, he might have, uh, he might have approved. I agree with you. I think uh, Bard in earlier years shied away from too much emphasis on the spirit, afraid of the liberal tradition, which placed so much emphasis on God consciousness, but also on the Catholic tradition in emphasizing the authority of tradition through an ongoing work of the spirit in the history of the church. And Bart was also shying back from that, the, the word of God being more uh, finished work, if you will. Um, and, and, but Bart later on did come to see the error of that way and, and, and to want to recapture the Holy Spirit, but on different grounds, not on anthropological territory right. as a, simply an anthropological category. So he, his, his, um, his essay on Schleiermacher in his 19th century theology, um, he says, that's where he says concerning Schleiermacher, you have to, you have to love here before you can hate here in yeah. terms of Schleiermacher, but he argues, he says Schleiermacher was right to raise the issue of the third article, but he just raised it in the wrong place. You shouldn't raise it as an anthropological category. You have to raise it as a means by which God imparts himself to us. So let's not look at religious consciousness, let's look at Pentecost. Yeah. 
uh, as the point of departure for pneumatology. Exactly. It's a gift before it is a transformative power. And that, and, and I think that's where Bart tries to reclaim pneuma, pneumatology on biblical grounds. And he, he saw that rather than shying away from it, he should have redefined it mm -hmm. along those lines. And, and, and that, that really, I think, was the bug in my ear for the direction of my own research on spirit baptism. One of the things that, that uh, well, let me just say this as, as my concluding uh, comment. Um, I think that the Pentecostal movement picked up where the Western Holiness movement dropped the ball theologically uh, for a variety of reasons. And, uh, but I do think initially that the Pentecostal movement, and it's understandable, uh, raised a lot of concerns out of my own Wesleyan holiness tradition because of what it felt to be as extreme spiritism uh, and uh, of a disconnect between the Holy Spirit and, and Christ. Now I see there is a great uh, point of real reconciliation uh, of the Pentecostal tradition with its roots in the Wesleyan holiness tradition. And, and I see the Wesleyan holiness, the traditional Wesleyan holiness movement appreciating and reaching out more to the Pentecostals. And I see the Pentecostals saying, hey, that's our history. Amen. And we're coming back there. That's, that's exactly right. That's where we're reaching. You can help us get there. <laughs> <laughs>